Good afternoon, and yes indeed it is, Friday afternoon in fact, and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark, and this is my 28 minute stint where I talk a bit about my pet subject, which is um, mental health, and it's not something that I've just suddenly come across and jumped on the bandwagon, and like everybody else, and, you know, started to chirp on about hope and stuff like that. It's not my game, it's not my thing. I've been doing this job now for about six years and a long, long, long time before this became popular. There was a couple of voices in the wilderness who weren't particularly well understood, people like Mike King, and at the time it was a, a curiosity, a novel thing on TV, I remember he did the Nutters Club and stuff like that and in those days it was kind of like oh what's this and people started treating it with a bit of interest and before you knew it <clears throat> that snowball started rolling down the hill and got bigger and bigger and bigger until it became an absolute tsunami and everybody jumped on board and everybody's raising money and it becomes a fad or a fashion which always makes me feel somewhat naked because I think as soon as they come they go you know that is the trouble with fair weather friends and most of them are whichever way that wind blows that's the way they go used to be smoking now it's mental health next will be obesity and they'll be gone and I'll still be here and I'll be thinking oh what a shame we were so close to getting somewhere, to getting to an understanding, except for people like Mr Bob. That's what I'm going to call him, Mr Bob. That's his name, Bob. Bob calls people with mental illness snowflakes, right? That's his, that's his slight, that's his prejudice. And if he wants to go on like that amongst his friends, well, I'll be looking at him and thinking, well, Bob, you're sick and you're sad, you little, little apusion. You are the problem, you are the cancer of society when you belittle people in such a way. That lack of understanding, that prejudice is something that I've been subjected to for half a century. You weren't beaten every week, every day. You weren't punished, you weren't poisoned, you weren't raped. You got through all that okay. You were one of the 50%, 50% of the lucky few. And so you turn around and you shite on those who have suffered. And your lack of understanding is the problem in society, Mr Bob. You are the one that is the problem. You are the one that has caused this through your lack of care and your willingness to abuse people. This is not about sitting around the fire, singing kumbaya and clapping hands. This is about listening. Okay, your ears, Mr. Bob, were not painted on by God. They were given to you for a reason. Try and use them. And the grey matter in between them, try and engage that. It will be nice. we are really handy. I don't expect you to cry me a river, matey. I don't. All I expect you to do is listen. You want to walk away, hey, I've seen so many backs in my lifetime, that's just about all I know. And that's fine, you want to walk away, you walk away. You want to treat me, you want to treat others with indifference, that's fine. Walk away. But don't stand there on national television and abuse people because that is destructive, it is erosive. It undermines what so many people have worked so hard to get across to everybody else. I'm not looking for your tears and I'm not looking for your money. I'm looking to change the world, to change our society, a person, a heart at a time, and realise that if we talk about things, <clears throat> if we find ways past our problems, over, under, round, whatever, we can move forward together as a better society and build something where we're all happy, not half of us, or 10% of us, but the majority of us. If we talk about family violence 
and how we don't accept it and we all stand up for each other. Instead of saying, not my problem and turning your back and you hear that poor woman next door screaming and pleading and begging and you can hear the bashing and you do nothing about it. You don't even call the cops. Then you are the problem. And she suffers and her children suffer. And that's what I'm trying to stop. That's what I'm trying to bring an end to. Because violence begets violence. Crime begets crime. Those who suffer become the perpetrators later on down the line. They don't come from anywhere else. No one walks down the street and says, you know what, I think tonight I'll bash my kids. It doesn't work that way. What happens is they are those subjected to that and they are simply biding their time, waiting their opportunity to do to the weak and helpless what was done to them when they were weak and helpless. It's what it is. And that's their escape and that blind rage, that violence that's inside them, all bottled up, just waiting to be meted out upon somebody when they have no escape. No chance, nowhere else to go but to get down on their knees and, and hug the perpetrator's leg and beg them to stop. Don't call me a snowflake and don't do that to anybody else, please. It hurts. There are a lot of people in this country who had it way, way worse than me. I knew them, I spoke to them, kids that came out of the Apuni boys' home. I'm not trying to say that I had it worse than anybody else. I'm trying to say that I understand those who have suffered. And I am not playing a Stradivarius for them. I'm standing up for them, myself and everybody else. People think it's brave. It's not. It's not brave. It's nothing about bravery. It's just about being honest. It's just about facing the harsh realities that life is not all roses and rose-coloured glasses for us all. And unfortunately, people who are subjected to violence and persecution carry it for a long, long, long time. They're not scars, they're wounds. And they carry them forever. In fact, it often has a knock-on effect into relationships with partners, with children. Those people's children's lives are affected by what's happened to them one way or another. Whether they're subjected to that continued violence or the person swings way back the other way. The pendulum doesn't tend to fall in the middle. It goes one way or t'other. You're either totally into it or totally against it. I would hope it will be totally against the horrible things that happened and maybe you could teach your children that that's not the way forward. You know, I... I saw this program on um, Stan Walker and that poor fellow was, was subjected to far worse than, than most other people and I found it amazing that he could um, talk about it even, you know, horrible thing and yet he's gone on to become a rock and roll star, he's achieved, he's, um, you know, lifted so many people up, his music ain't my cup of tea but He's my kind of man because I think he'll be probably the finest father there ever was. You'll never raise a hand to his kids, that's for sure. He'll be a good man, a good father. And those are the sort of people that we need to support and get around because they radiate a goodness and a light, which is what our society is lacking. This indifference is the main problem. People just saying... What can I do? It's too big. I'm just one little person. I can't change the world. That's where you're 100% absolutely, utterly wrong. The only people and the only person that can change what's happening is you. It doesn't happen at a, at a governmental level. God doesn't suddenly decide he's going to change the world overnight. It happens one person at a time, and it happens with just a little bit of consideration, a kind word, or even not being nasty, not pushing it in front of people, not grabbing things, not 
being inconsiderate, but being considerate, thinking about more than yourself. And I think that's appropriate for this time of year more than any other. Christmas is coming and this is supposed to be season of joy, of goodwill to all people. So I want my listeners to you out there to think about that goodwill. You know, you're going to be sitting down there hopefully with a decent meal and a box of chocolates come Christmas Day, but there's many that won't. I want you to think about those people and think about a fair and just society. That's where I'm trying to get, and I'd like to think we're all doing our little bit for that, that we can come out of COVID with a better world, a more understanding world. You know, our Prime Minister has talked about kindness. Consideration, respect for each other. I don't want the same old world coming out of COVID as where we went in. I was watching this country and and indeed the world get worse and worse and worse. Television encouraging you to be more selfish, more self-centred, less caring, more indifferent. I want to see less of that. I would like to think that this has pulled us closer together, this COVID thing, that this has made us reflect a little bit more on those around us and you realise that no one is an island. We are a community. All we have is each other and all we have is this life. This is not a test run. So if we can make it a little bit better for somebody else, what an achievement, you know. Well, what a great thing to do. Just help one or two. And you, you, I don't care what you do, but... Look, even if you sprinkle a few crumbs of of dry charity, that's fine with me. A tin of spaghetti in the food bank. You know? How hard? A buck. Gee, surely, surely. You know? I'll do my little bit. I won't be doing mountains. I won't be saving thousands of souls. I'll do my little bit this year. And if everybody does just a little bit, then that is a mountain of change. And if everybody does nothing, then that's a mountain of an obstacle. So it's all about just taking one step forward. And recovering from mental health is no different. It's, it's about taking one step forward. It's not about moving from where you are now to where you need to be in an instant. And a lot of people seem to think that it's like this. You just switch it on and off like a light. I remember someone saying to me about a year ago, oh, you're much better these days. And I said, look, I have good days and I have bad days too. I try not to show you the bad days and I try and put on a brave face and that's the way I try and face the world. I I don't want to wallow in self-pity, nor do I want pity from anybody else. That he is even more bitter than lemons, my friend. I don't want that. I want you to understand, and I want you to, to change the world. I want to think that the kids of the next generation are not going to suffer like the children of my generation did, and that's, that's not one generation. I mean, that's, that's, we're getting close to two, even three now. So it's taken a long time. It's taken a half a century for us to look at our own warts and do something about it. And I know it is starting to change, and I am trying to encourage that. I'm not trying to throw stones. It's not my thing. What I'm trying to do is just to get people to pause (coughs) and think about those around themselves to (coughs) enjoy this wonderful country, enjoy this wonderful Christmas break we're coming up to because... We do truly live in paradise, but we need to make it a good place for everybody. And unfortunately, a true reflection of our self-centeredness is, you know, I watched this Why Am I Fat on TV the other day, and I nearly fell off my chair when Simon Galt said (coughs) one-third, one-third of all adults in this country are obese, and... I do believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure he said 100% of Polynesian women over the age of 35, 100% are obese. 
And the trouble is that there's too much junk food and too much sugar out there. You know, it's easy to point the finger and cast blame and say, oh, well, you're just cramming it down your cake hole and it's all your fault. But that's not true. It's not true at all. That's just, again, ignorance, slight and prejudice. People are encouraged in a busy life to consume convenience foods. And those convenience foods are packed, packed, packed with sugar and fat, carbohydrates, more than ever before. It is not necessarily the people, it is their diets. And, and we need better diets in this country. We don't need all this sugar. But the people who manufacture it and the people who retail it know only too well if they cram it full of sugar, we're just going to want more, more, more. And it is extremely hard to be disciplined when all of this stuff is constantly, there's this constant barrage of advertising to encourage you to eat unhealthy takeaway foods that are made of reconstituted ground-up garbage. You don't want to know what's in your chicken burger. You don't even want to ask. And you don't even want to be eating it. You don't. It's not good. Whereas, the fish burger, that's hokey and it's damn fine and delicious and good stuff and I hope you support that industry. So, you know, we need to be a little bit more discerning and we need our voices to be heard and put a bit more pressure on people so that we don't have all this ignorance and prejudice about mental health and we don't have all these terrible diets that everybody's encouraged to have. You know, I look at the queues outside the takeaways from about 6 to 8 o'clock. I, I sit there in the car park and I watch them piling in there and I think, boy, it's midweek. This is no weekend treat. This is your regular thing. And I look at the size of the people and I think, crikey, do you really need to be doing this to yourself? And <laughs> sometimes I despair, but Sometimes I think, well, you know, if enough people start talking about this, then we'll realise that things like obesity lead to depression. They exacerbate depression. People will have poorer health, both physically and mentally. They will have poor physical health. They will die earlier. They will be more depressed. They will struggle more in their jobs. They will be treated or mistreated in society as a result of the signs that they are. And this is all done not just by them but to them as well. So we need to change this whole way of thinking. We need to see healthy alternatives and encourage people to eat meat. Stop talking about cows farting and actually eat that beautiful, clean, iron-rich, lean meat that those farmers produce for us. Thank you very much, farmers. You're doing a bang-up job. Thank you so much. The animals are looking gorgeous. The hay's coming in. And, and, and my heart delights when I drive through the countryside and see what a fantastic job you're doing. I really do appreciate your efforts. So to all those farmers out there, hang on in there. Some of us love you. You're wonderful people, and thank you very much for your hard work, for paying those taxes, for making that food and helping this country out. I really, really appreciate everything that you do for us. I do. To all of those fishermen out there risking their lives, I've done that job. I know what hard graft is, mate. Covered from head to foot in blood and guts all day. I know how tough it is. I know how you risk your life. I know the high highs and I know the days when you come home smacked up by a rough sea, wet ass, not much to show for it, and I know how hard that is. So for those out you out there doing the mahi, doing the hard graft, Thank you very much for all your efforts. We do appreciate that, some of us anyway. And I hope that the general public comes round to see, you know, what wonderful people you are, how hard you work and what good food you make for us. And, you know, if only we could all afford it easily, um, you know, we would be much healthier and much happier as a result. Well, I usually read a story um, 
during my time, but I just had a little glance at the clock and realised that I've talked for far too long and there's no way that I'm going to squeeze a story in today, so I won't try. I prattle on, if you don't mind, for about another eight minutes. You know, being on the benefit, which I am, on an invalid's benefit, means that I get to see a lot of people at the lower end of society, below the poverty line, in fact, the majority of people I know live below the poverty line because you tend to move in certain circles. Those working, uh, busy in their offices or their factories or locked away at home during the day and, and I don't tend to associate with those people anymore. I did work. For decades I paid taxes and did the graft and I wasn't too bad at my job. And... In those days, I didn't know very many people who were on the rock and roll because I was busy grafting, and I lived with grafters, worked with grafters, drank with grafters, ate with grafters. That's the world you live in, and those are the circles that you move in. And those circles tend to have opinions, attitudes, slights and prejudices within their own little circles. And each group tends to look at the world differently. They carry these prejudices which tend to be common, a commonality throughout each circle, whether they be upper class, whether they be working class, or whether they be the unemployed class, which is a class of its own. And that's unfortunate. There tends to be fences of of ignorance and prejudice between them. And these... um, Factions of society tend to be pitted against each other. Those working are encouraged to look down upon those not and consider them to be less, to the point where that's reinforced by government. To give you an example, if if you're on the dole and you want to live with somebody, you have to tell the government that you're living with them. Now, that doesn't happen anywhere else in society. If you're working and you choose to have a relationship, well, nobody needs to be told. But if you're on the benefit, the government must know that you're living under the same roof as somebody else and that you're in a relationship. And they will financially punish you for doing so. They will cut The amount of money you live on, even although you're already below the poverty line, they're going to drive you further down. The argument being that two can live as cheaply as one, well, that's obviously not true. If you've ever lived with a partner, you know that's not true. You don't live at half the cost. You don't spend a whole lot less at all. But to me, to me, this is a violation of people's human rights, that you should... You should have to tell a government authority how you live your life and your relationships are dictated by that. You don't want to live under the same roof. You are forced to live apart. You cannot have the relationship you want because you quite simply can't afford it. You've got too many debts and too many bills to be able to live with your loved one. So you're no longer allowed that privilege unless you're prepared to be financially encumbered, to be restricted by what you can do, further restricted. And as far as the poverty line goes, there's about 50% of our society living below or at the poverty line. We even now have the working poor who are on minimum wage, but because of house prices now and therefore rent prices going up, they can't afford to live on minimum wage and have to go to the government to get a top up so that they can pay the rent and the food. Alarm bells are ringing, people. Alarm bells are ringing. If you cannot afford to live even on minimum wage then something needs to change, and that would be the wage. Now, I know that that's not an easy thing, to push people's salaries up high enough that they can survive okay and maybe save a bit of coin, maybe even save up for a house someday. But that's what needs to happen. We cannot force property prices down. That can't be done. Well, 
It can, but if you do, the chances are everything will fall apart. So it's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous game to play and should never be done. So if you can't force house prices down, you've got to push wages up. But what we've got to remember is house prices are only extraordinarily high in lovely Auckland. And Auckland is lovely. There's no sarcasm there. I love the place. The more I go there, the more I see what a wonderful place it is. And I can understand why people want to live there. But here's a thought. What about we encourage people to live in other parts of the country? Because there are some amazing, awesome places. Like the west coast of the South Island. You know, they are crying out for skills. Even my town up in Pahiatua, we need tradespeople, men and women. We need um, doctors, nurses, dentists. You know, our town is short of everything. and Everyone is crammed into Auckland, pushing and shoving and sick of the traffic. Well, I'll tell you what, we don't have rush hours. There's no such thing. You drive home at 5 o'clock in the morning, you'll hardly have to hit the brakes, mate, and you'll be home in three minutes flat. So what we need to do, I suggest, is encourage people to go to other parts. Go down to the far south. Go and live in Southland, Dunedin. Mate, it's amazing down there. You are so close to Stewart Island, and believe you me, if you've never been there, you really need to go. It's amazing. The Catlins are incredible. The west coast is gorgeous. Queenstown, Tiana, Manapuri, it goes on and on and on. The lakes, the fishing... The beautiful East Coast as well, it's, it's, it's just stunning. Get up to Chitch Chitch, up the Banks Peninsula on that, or down to Littleton Harbour. It, the place is gorgeous, and more people should live there. And if they did, they'd find, hey, guess what? The house price is down there. You know, Christchurch excluded, perhaps, but the rest of it, the house prices are so cheap. The people are so good. And they would truly welcome anyone who's got any skills to get down there and put their shoulder to the wheel rather than everybody cramming into a single city. So maybe we want to spread out a little bit, my friends. And this includes places like the Naki. There's another great place to live. Um, the Wire Wrapper. Hawke's Bay, they're crying out for pickers. Why not get into it and, you know, help, help the country out? Gisborne. Napier, Hastings, oh, the climate's delicious. The walk down marine parade down by Ocean Beach there is just awesome. You can catch fish straight off the beach there. It's, you know, the south end of Ocean Beach. It's just lovely there. And it's nice to see you all in the Hawke's Bay, by the way. Good to have you on board. I hope you're doing well. I know you've been through some tough times. You had some floods not long ago. You do de- tend to get a bit of a lashing there occasionally and, you know, it was, it was heartbreaking to see those people suffering. But, you know, we're thinking of you and I hope you have a good summer. I know the pickers, you know, the orchards are going to struggle with lack of pickers. It's going to be tough, but hopefully everyone's going to charge in there and, and we have a good season. Right, well, that's me for another week. I hope you enjoyed my little chat. I know I go 100 miles an hour, but let's just hope it was provocative and and maybe even thought-provoking. Thank you very much for tuning in and see what you can do for someone else this week before I see you, probably one last time before Christmas. Take care of each other. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, Veronica, Wairarapa TV and all the sponsors. Over and out for now. Have a good week, eh? Cheers.